Well, there's just not much known. It's a, you know, it's a field I spent a lot of time and effort in, but I mean, it's hard enough to figure out uh, how uh, insects navigate, you know, when you try to get to humans. Uh, yeah. Scientific evidence is on anything of human significance is very slight. I mean, there's a lot of evidence on how the visual system works, uh, you know, how the motor system works, and so on. But uh, uh, when you get to more complex problems, uh, there are problems of the kinds you can't even answer for insects. Mm -hmm. Not much to say about humans. Well, you know, look, we, we, the human beings are organic creatures, they're not angels, uh, which means that there's going to be necessarily uh, limits to uh, understanding and that we don't know what they are, but they're going to be there. Uh, there's no particular reason why the brain should be out of reach of uh, the kinds of uh, techniques of research and inquiry that we have, but it's a very hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, take, take a look at, if you really look at the science, uh, so right, right here at MIT, for example, there's been a project for decades on uh, uh, nematodes, you know, tiny little worms that have uh, 800 cells and 300 neurons. And, uh, the entire wiring diagram is known, you know, but trying to figure out what they do is uh, <laughs> I mean, it's perfectly possible, and has been argued, that the whole tradition of neuroscience for hundreds of years actually is off in the wrong direction. Okay. There's, a very, if you're, there's a very interesting book by a very fine uh, cognitive neuroscientist, uh, Randy Gallistel, is it Rutgers, Ralph Gallistel and Kane. Okay. I forget the title, but what, what they basically argue pretty plausibly, I think, is that uh, neuroscience is a little bit like the famous story about the drunk looking under the lamppost. He lost his key on the other side of the street, but this is where the light is. You know? right. And uh, they're looking at something that comes out of what's more or less understood. Uh, neuroscience has a kind of an associationist uh, intellectual framework. So you look for strengthening of uh, synaptic connections with uh, repetition and so on. And uh, Gallistel argues that's just not the way the brain works. Uh, he says the brain is basically like a computer. It has uh, the kinds of units. If you look at the cognitive achievements, what, what animal, he's mostly talking about insects, but if you look at uh, what insects do, uh, they're basically computing, and the computer, we understand the basic theory of computers, they have uh, units on which you can write something, you can read from it, and you can address it, so you can find it somewhere else, and he says, Neurosciences ought to be looking for units like that because they seem to be the basic units of cognition. But as, the, as long as you're just looking at, say, uh, synaptic connections and associations, you just never find it. You look forever. In a sense, I mean, the, uh, I mean it's, it's, it, with linguistics and the brain science, it's a special problem. Uh, if you study the visual system, you can use comparative evidence and you can use invasive experimentation mm -hmm. with animals. Maybe you shouldn't, but you do do it. So you stick electrodes into the brains of monkeys and cats and so on. Uh, in the case of humans, in the case of language, there's no comparative evidence. Other organisms just don't have the capacity. And uh, we don't permit ourselves to do invasive experimentation with humans. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, it was done at one point, actually, in Canada. There's a famous uh, neuroscientist, brain scientist, uh, Willard Penfield, mm -hmm. this is 60 years ago. He, uh, during, uh, he discovered a lot of things, but by methods that aren't permitted anymore. Mm -hmm. While he was uh, doing brain, he was brain surgery, and while he was 
you know, this fellow who was doing brain surgery and also investigated uh, things about what the brain was doing. And uh, you can find things out that way, but it's not permissible. So, so there's no comparative evidence, and you can't do basic experimentation, which makes it very hard. Yeah. Um, there is some, there are results, and some of them are interesting, but they're, they, they have to be gotten in more sophisticated ways. Being in the right place at the right time, most of, a lot of it's accident. And it's the fact that I'm here is an accident. That, uh, when I got my PhD at Harvard, uh, I, I was in the, the, I wasn't in any field, no identifiable field, and uh, there were no academic openings. In fact, my first book, uh, 50 55 years ago, was turned down by MIT Press because. Mm -hmm with reviewers' comments, which were pretty sensible, saying, well, we don't know what this is, there's yeah. nothing around like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, I did get an interview at, uh, with the head of the electronics lab here through friends, mm -hmm. Jerry Wiesner, and he, I talked to him a little about my work, and he was kind of interested in it, and uh, he suggested that I would join a machine translation project that they had. And I told him I'd be happy to be here, but I'm not working on machine translation, but it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And then I discussed it with him, and apparently thought that was pretty good. <laughs> so he hired me as a research assistant, and that's what I'm from that. But it had to do with uh, things that were happening in the society at the time. Yeah. Uh, there was a ton of research money coming in from the government, actually, in the Pentagon. Uh, that's uh, I mean, yeah, kind of close it. I mean the whole uh, you know, the whole IT revolution. Yeah, the computers, the internet, IBM. So it was all being developed under Pentagon funding at places like RLE. And uh, the, uh, now it's interesting what's happened. I mean, we don't have a free enterprise economy. Nothing remotely like it. The, Basic entrepreneurial work, the creative, inventive yeah. work is mostly done in the states. Uh, who uh, feeds at the public trough? Mm -hmm. You know, there's kind of competition in that. Yeah. But it's, uh, and a lot of the work is done, you know, right at where, I mean, this is called a private university, but it was probably 90% funded by the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and the research was done here on, for decades mm -hmm. on computers. And, Internet, uh, mm -hmm. microelectronics, and software, you know. And finally, it's handed over to private enterprise to make profit. It's basically the way the system works. Well, Pentagon funding has actually declined, and uh, NIH funding has increased. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. The cutting edge of the economy is no longer electronics based, it's biology based. Mm -hmm. So the public has to pay for it in a different way. Well, but it's, uh, it's pretty much the way the system works. You can have a more just society. A more just society. Like we have a more just society now than we had 50 years ago in many ways. And could get a lot more just. There are a lot of dimensions to justice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you walk outside in the halls yep. here, You'll see about half women and uh, half minorities and so on. Mm -hmm. If you walked in the halls when I got here, it was all white men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a sign of a more just society. Mm -hmm. And that's all over the world, all over, not just here. Mm -hmm. uh, Anarchism is just a process. Mm -hmm. It's not an you know, identifiable a model system. Or... It's the process of dismantling the illegitimate authorities. They may be doing it in the Supreme Court right now. We don't right. know. Uh, we'll see how it comes out. But one possible outcome is will be a step towards dismantling illegitimate structures of authority and domination. There's a whole array of structures of authority and domination that are part of. The, we're always part of. Mm -hmm. Some of them can be justified. And a lot of them can't, most of them. 
and yeah. the process of dismantling them is a step towards a more just society. Well, you know, it's, it's again, it's a question of more or less. So in, in the current, in the kind of world we live now, yeah. I think it's uh, beneficial to have a representative government, or to be more precise, it would be beneficial if we did have a representative government. We don't. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take a look at, say, the United States, uh, uh, there's some pretty good studies by interest in professional political science. You may have come across them of uh, uh, the relation between attitudes and policy. And it turns out about 70% of the population is essentially disenfranchised. Lower 70% of the income scale, their attitudes have no influence on policy. The political class doesn't pay attention to them. Right. They take a look at, say, Senate, how senators behave. Uh, they pay no attention to the bottom income third, mm -hmm. but a little attention to the middle income third, a lot of attention to the top. When we get to the top, a tenth of a percent, to mm -hmm. listen very carefully and do what they say. No. That's a plutocracy, it's not a democracy. Minimal condition of democracy, minimal, very minimal, is that uh, people's opinions matter. Mm -hmm. If people's opinions don't matter, you might as well call it fashion. You know. mm -hmm. So yes, that's but that's minimal. Yeah. Uh, there's another question as to how they are able to form their opinions. So do they have access to information? Uh, do they have? Uh, and we have huge institutions in our societies, Canada too, which are devoted to trying to make people stupid. Mm -hmm. like one of them is called advertising, right. uh, which is a it's a huge industry. Its whole purpose is to undermine markets. Uh, nobody talks about it because you're not supposed to think about the world. But if you've ever taken an economics course, you learn that markets are based on informed consumers making rational choices. Okay, turn on the <laughs> television set. Uh, Here's your information. And what they're trying to make create uninformed consumers <laughs> making irrational choices. And that's a reflection of the monopolization of the economy. If you had a real competitive economy, mm -hmm. which there was in a sense maybe uh, 150 years ago, mm -hmm. you had very little advertising. Uh, people sold goods because people wanted them. And if you wanted to present what you had for sale, mm -hmm. you described it. Uh, as you move towards higher levels of monopolization, oligopoly, uh, uh, companies don't want price wars because it cuts into their profits. So what you try to do is a kind of tacit collusion about prices and you try to develop profit differentiation along you know, bigger tail fins and you know, whatever it may be. But, uh, so keep away from price wars and try to uh, create product differentiation along things that really don't matter, okay. emotions and others, that's advertising. And the same in the political system. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the political system, it's uh, it's basically run by PR agencies. Mm -hmm. And the, the, what they want to do is create an uninformed electorate that will make an irrational choice. There are people. There are places where it's been uh, carried out very effectively. So take Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, Goebbels was very impressed by American commercial advertising. Mm -hmm. Wrote about it, mm -hmm. and he said we can use those techniques to bring uh, uh, not only support but gratification to the Germans, and he did mm -hmm. uh, before the. Defeats, you know, before Stalingrad yeah. and so on, and Nazis probably had 90% support of the population. Yeah. And people were emotionally satisfied. Yeah. It wasn't very pretty, but yeah. worked. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, you should somehow manipulate people in ways which will mm -hmm. gratify them is a strictly totalitarian. Yeah, in its own. Mm -hmm. I mean, people ought to be able to figure out for themselves what they like.
Mm-hmm. In fact, a lot of advertising is based on what's called fabricating want. Yeah. And sometimes it becomes comical. Yeah. Like you've studied this stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now there's a... If you take a psychology, you take a look at academic psychology, there's a subfield of academic psychology which is devoted, applied psychology, which is devoted to how to get children. It's the study of nagging. Hmm. How can you get, what are the different kinds of ways in which children nag their parents? That was initiated by the advertising industry. Oh, wow. They realized that uh, there's a big segment of the population that they're not, don't make money and they're not mine. So we've got to get them to nag their parents. <clears throat> you know, I want that $400 mechanical toy, and if I don't have it, I'm going to die. You know? <laughs> the, the parents break down and buy it yeah. and it throws it away in yeah. five minutes. But uh, that's a large, that's, a, that's the kind of thing you expect in a society that's based on trying to induce stupidity. Mm-hmm. And there's a good reason for it. I mean, take something much more significant in which Canada's personally involved, and that's uh, uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's a major effort by the corporate sector here to uh, introduce teaching programs into the schools which will deny uh, climate change. They call it balanced teaching, uh, just like the creationists do. We can't stop teaching evolution, but let's teach creation science. So uh, uh, American Legislative Exchange Council, the corporate-funded propaganda agency, are creating a curricula for K-12 to to introduce a balanced teaching on science into the schools. So, okay, we say, yeah, these guys who think humans are doing something about the climate, but uh, uh, there's others who say, look, it's, it's just sunspots. So mm-hmm. you have a balanced teaching. And meanwhile, Canada can uh, exploit the tar sands and destroy the world very happily. You know? mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's the kind of thing you expect in a uh, kind of a state capitalist society. Um, and in this case, Canada is the main, one of the major criminals, mm-hmm. not just uh, oil. I mean, Canadian mining corporations all over the world are an absolute disaster. I've seen a lot of it in my own work. Okay. So it's money, but because of the way money is dealt with. I mean, take, it, take the banks, okay? So in the 1950s and the 1960s, which were the huge growth period mm-hmm. in the United States, mm-hmm. and I think probably Canada, uh, banks were some place on the corner where mm-hmm. you deposited your money if you had some extra money and they lent it to somebody who wanted to buy mm-hmm. a car or something like that. There weren't any interstate banks. Mm-hmm. The banks were not involved in complex investments and, you know, derivatives and none, none of that stuff. Uh, this took off in the 70s. It's part of the whole neoliberal shift. Mm-hmm. And uh, by now, uh, and there were no financial crises, incidentally, mm-hmm. not a single one in the 50s and the 60s, mm-hmm. uh, because you had the New Deal regulations in place and the banks were basically doing what they're supposed to do in a state capitalist society, you know, um, uh, taking funds from different sources and voting them to some constructive purpose. Uh, um, but since the 70s, it's totally untrue. The banks are mostly involved in uh, complex uh, transactions to make a lot of money mm-hmm. because you're a tenth of a second ahead of the next guy and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And there's the drain on the society. Mm-hmm. And they're a huge part of the economy. I mean, they're now probably almost half corporate profits of financial institutions, which probably contribute nothing, maybe harmful. Mm-hmm. So that's so it's not the money. You know, the money was there in the 50s, too. It's, I mean, there are a lot of illusions about money, a lot of Austrian nonsense. <coughs> but it's not the money. I mean, you're going to have some means of exchange, yeah. you know. But it's, it's based on, it's true that it's based on trust. It's not based on anything concrete. 
<laughs> Is there one piece of advice? Yeah, truism. Be honest, open-minded, concerned with the consequences of what you do, like any human being. Yeah.